It's the Locked On Flyers podcast for Monday, July 24th. Your daily dose of Flyers news, analysis, and high quality content is going to look at some Russian hockey history here. I love it. Yeah, we're going to compare past Russian top prospects to Matt Vey Mitchkov, plus a new poll question and our nemesis of the week, all on today's show. Your Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, thanks for making Locked On Flyers your first listen every day. I am Rachel Donner. You can find me on Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here as always with Russ Cohen, who's on all your favorite social media apps at Sportsology. The show is also on Instagram and threads at Locked On Flyers as well. You can subscribe or follow us for free over on YouTube. We're on the SiriusXM app. Anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, you'll get our latest episode as soon as it's available here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Russ, just a small bit of Flyers news uh, before we get into our main topic of the day. Jordy Bellery re-signed with the Phantoms, which is good to see. Um, Good to have another veteran back to support the prospects. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I thought he was an important part of the team. Good to have him back. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Our main topic of the day is looking at some past Russian top prospects uh, as they were getting drafted and into their first year of the pros and say, okay, where does Matt Bay Mitchkov fall in the pantheon of Russian hockey players? Uh, Interestingly, the Flyers were the first team to draft a Soviet Russian player. There was a Russian player from like way back in the 1920s, but um, Viktor Kotulev was the first uh, Soviet drafted player picked in the ninth round way back when they had a gajillion rounds, 160th overall in 1975. And he never played in the NHL, uh, but, you know, this was when maybe the teams were going to start taking a risk and drafting guys in late rounds um, Mm -hmm. with the hope that maybe they would come over, but uh, chances were pretty slim back then. And, uh, you know, it took a while before some of the Soviet era players started defecting. Of course, Alexander McGilney is the first defected player to enter the NHL. He was drafted in 1988 by the Sabres, but in the fifth round and thinking about, you know, an NHL legend uh, should be hall of famer that uh, was drafted in the fifth round is absolutely wild, but that's the way it was then um, where you had teams, you know, just kind of taking a gander in these late round picks to see maybe one of these Russian guys would come over Um, Of course, the Russian five is super famous uh, from the Detroit Red Wings. Um, You had Sergei Fedorov and Vladimir Konstantinov drafted in 1989 in the fourth round. Um, You know, and and that was the beginning of the dynasty of the the Russians in Detroit. Um, There was one player that was legally allowed to leave and, and played for the Flames, uh, I th- I think that, you know, I guess one of the biggest differences uh, between then and now, but still kind of bleeds into now in terms of following Russian prospects, is just getting the information on them, right? And so back then, I think the yes. biggest thing that we were able to do, it, we were just only really able to see them play an international tournament. Yeah, and that was it. I mean, you weren't watching their junior games. You You weren't doing any of that. So that is how they found out. I mean, I did interview Bob Swatos, who ran the Sabres and did was the, the lead guy in that defection. Maybe one day we'll play some audio from that. It's amazing. Like, it's a whole murder mystery almost plot. Like, because uh-huh. they all could have been killed. Like, it just was that tense. But, yeah, back then it was all the, you know, as far as prospecting for Russian players was in its infancy. Yeah. And so I think, you know, talking about that era, obviously McGilney is the prototype for that era. And, 
um, you know, again, we really only saw him in those international tournaments, but that 1988 Olympic gold medal winning team from Russia uh, or the Soviet Union, then I should say, yes. uh, was uh, just, I think, a big eye opening thing for the rest of, of us internationally in terms of getting to see these Russian players, their skill set. And I think this is where, you know, they had maybe shifted a little bit in their style of play and having some smaller guys, but super skilled guys on these teams. And so, you know, that 88 Olympic team, we have McGillney, we have Igor Larionov, we have Igor Kravchuk, we have Sergei Makarov, we have Anatoly Semenov, who played for the Flyers briefly, if you recall. Yeah. And But talk about McGillney and his skill set and what we knew then about him and then we can sort of compare him to what we know about Mitch Koff now right yeah I mean he, you know he didn't have in his rookie year he didn't have the 76 goals but what he always had was speed that was way better than the average NHLer but what really his gift was was that his um side to side skating his lateral movement was so much better than defensemen that he could literally just even backwards, just work his way in towards the net and defenders couldn't even like do anything about it. Cause they, they couldn't keep up. Like, you know, now we would call it like good edge work and bi-directional skating and all that. He had a lot of that and not a lot of players did in the NHL. And so they couldn't contain him. Then if he happened to get a breakaway or something, you know, he might go top shelf even then, but he also would go five hole. Like he gets you to like, he just was incredibly patient. So the, he was a threat to score and he was a threat to also get assists. And he was just like a, he was a sniper, but he also could do some playmaking. So he was dangerous, man. He was super, super dangerous. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, you, you think about that kind of skill set and you compare it to Mitchkov, who is, I think, more completely offensively oriented right now. Yeah. That you, that you think that McGillney definitely had a more complete game, right? I mean, I would say so because they drummed it into those players back then. So I would say so. But I would say there's some McGillney in Mitchkoff in his offensive game. Now, I don't think he's going to go out and score 76 goals. So don't, you know, don't hold me to that because he's not. But he does have a great goal scoring ability and he does have ability to, you know, to get great assists and be a playmaker at times. So there is some McGillney in him for sure. Yeah, I think so as well. Um, it, I, I think that especially with Russian hockey, there's just like a specific style mm -hmm. that they are taught that has evolved over the years, I think. But you, you really know what era a Russian hockey player is from. And I think that they've sort of tried to take the best of each era so far. And the players mm -hmm. that are coming out of there now have like little bits and pieces. And that's where I see like the little bits and pieces of what Mitch Kopp does that are that you can trace back to McGillney, right? Right, right. I think that's fair to say. So I would say like the next era of Russian players, you, you know, you look at your Pavel Datsuk, Sergei Fedorov, and then Pavel Bure, right? That's kind of like those next years that were drafted in like 88, 89. Yeah. I, I would say. And, you know, again, it's wild to think that Pavel Datsuk was selected with the 171st overall pick. But again, this was like right before the Berlin Wall fell, right before the yep. fall of the Soviet Empire. So we were still in this closed system where it was a risk to take, you know, some of these guys. So, yeah, you know, Datsuk, again, late round pick in, in 98, Sergei Fedorov, um, fourth round pick in 1989. Which was and, really high. I mean, back then. Yeah. That was yeah. I mean, so like, so like with those two guys in particular, like what do you see in Mitch Kopp's game that ties back to those guys? Well, one thing about Bore, which is really interesting uh, and I wrote about this for the NHLPA. Uh, so Upper Deck sent a representative to get Pavel Bore money to sign him to be the spokesperson for the hockey set. And they basically crossed the border with a bag full of money. Like they yeah. went through all of that. Like, and they were terrified that they would get caught with it. And 
things would happen. But they literally went over there with a bag of money and gave it to him. That's how big of a star Upper Deck felt like he was going to be. If you go look at back some of those cards, they're crazy. Like he's rollerblading. Like it's just, <laughs> it's wild. But as far as talent wise, like he's, Mitch Kopp is not going to have the uh, goal scoring ability that Bore has. He has a great goal scoring ability, but Bore could score three or four a game. Like he just could just game break you that way. I think there's a lot of other things though. I think, you know, in today's world, he's going to be a better skater than Bore. And Bore was a terrific, terrific skater. He's definitely going to be more well rounded than Bore because Bore didn't really play any defense. Uh, yeah. And of course, Pavel Bure was uh, famously drafted a year ahead of schedule because the Canucks figured out that he was eligible when everybody right. else you know, thought that he wasn't, but he had played right. in enough international games in order to qualify. Um, so that was also a time, <laughs> I must say. It was. I think if, if Mitch Koff were to have 65% of the impact that Bory had and eventually had, you'd be talking. Like, that would really be something. So that's something, because I think Bore, I think he won the Calder, didn't he? No, I don't know off the top of my head, but it off seems the, like he the, would have. I think he did. I think he was one of them that did. Um, and so, like, he had a just a massive, massive impact. And, yeah, I think I think you could look for a similar impact. Yeah, he did win it. Um, and I also think that you just have to temper the, the goal scoring. Cause I think Bory is just an all timer when it comes to goal scoring. And I can't say right. that about Mitchkov yet. Fedorov is a different bird. Like, you, like he was playing defense when he was young. Right. But he was skating wise. You noticed Sergei Fedorov right away. He was a, just a tremendous skater and he had to be, cause again, he eventually played a year on defense on the blue line when Detroit needed him to, but uh, he was different because again, the speed, the hockey IQ was off the charts for Sergei Fedorov. And that was another reason. And again, he was well-rounded, super well-rounded. Yeah. So I think if, I think if Mitch Cup took anything from Fedorov, it might be the, um, the hockey IQ part. I think that's really yeah, high, well, especially in the offensive zone. He's never going to be the defensive player that Sergei Fedorov turned out to be. No way. Yeah, I don't think so either. But there's so much more to talk about with uh, Pavel Datsyuk, uh, the details on him. And then we're going to shift into the next era of Russian superstars with Ilya Kovalchuk, Alex Ovechkin, and Evgeny Malkin coming up next. Today's episode is brought to you by a product I literally use every day, AG1. Maybe you're like me. You want to be healthy and eat well, but it's always easier said than done. That's no longer the case with AG1. AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that delivers comprehensive nutri nutrients to support whole body health. With one delicious scoop of AG1 and a glass of water each day, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy recovery, and focus all those things. It can be hard and expensive to keep track of multiple different supplements and vitamins. Not to mention how hard it can be on your stomach. AG1 costs you less than $3 a day. You're investing in your health and it's cheaper than your cold brew habit. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. If a con comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then try AG1 and get a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to a drinkag1.com slash NHL network. That's drinkag1.com slash NHL network. Check it out. We will be recording our mailbag episode for the Wednesday show real soon. So get your questions in. You can email us at lockdownflyers at gmail, comment on YouTube, or you can tweet us at lockdownflyers. Uh, getting back into our Russian hockey history and Matt Bay Mitchkov discussion here, uh, Pavel Datsyuk, uh, you know, I think that he was part of that smaller skill player trend that happened with that 88 Olympic team. And 
uh, the Red Wing scouts, um, especially their European scouts, just were famous for being able to find gems. Uh, and, and that's why they were so good at that time. Talked about uh, Datsyuk similarly to things that you hear about Mitchcock. So great hands, good hockey sense, quick skater, uh, deceptive speed. And I, I think that, you know, there's some similarities and you can see where Mitchkov's game, you know, he could lean on the history of Dotson, right? Yeah. So like Dotson's rookie year was good. He didn't win the Calder, but it was good, but it was going to get a lot better. And you could see the hands. The hands were great. The puck was always on a stick. That was always the case. And he was really great at defense. Like, you know, Mitchkoff will never be past Pavel Datsuk on defense. Most players will never be Pavel Datsuk on defense. But the, just the way the puck is on his stick and the hands, that's where you could attribute um, some Mitchkoff to that. And I think that's where um, some of that comes in. Yeah. So then I would say like the next big era of superstar Russian players comes into play in the early aughts. Ilya Kovalchuk is the first Russian to be a number one overall draft pick in 2001, uh, picked by the Thrashers, RIP to that team. And I think, you know, that was kind of a harbinger for the 2004 draft, which famously had Alex Ovechkin and Evgeny Malkin go one, two. And I think, you know, you saw with Malkin and Ovi and Kovalchuk, I would say the physical play, comes back into the picture, I think, a little bit for those Russians, that they had a more all-around game that matched kind of where the NHL was going at that time. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, the 0-1 draft was my first, so I was just learning about Kovalchuk and tremendous scorer, like just could sniff out a goal like almost anywhere, but also a skill passer. So there is a lot of Mitchkov in him, and Mitchkov maybe has a chance to be better than Kovalchuk. But that's a high bar. Like people might – dismiss Kovalchuk but you gotta remember even through all the stuff he went through he led that devil's team to the Stanley Cup yeah. in he did. so so he was pretty special so I think that's where Kovalchuk leads off now that 04 draft like everybody knew Ovechkin was going to to the Capitals like I think Ted Leonsis has kind of right. made that known early if I remember but I I may have been one of the first people to write about Malkin in the world juniors now the world juniors really started to become a factor especially with Ovechkin like that was like really noticeable and Malkin too. And I wrote an article about Malkin and, and that world junior is like, wow, this guy's a star. And so Malkin, of course, the size makes him a different kind of player than Michkov. But uh, again, I think what you take away from, from Malkin, he plays a different position, but the overall stick and puck control is, is tremendous on Malkin. When he really doesn't want you to have the puck, you won't get the puck. And I think that's where um, he's got for Malkin. Now, with Ovechkin, and, and with Ovechkin, it's tough, right? Because he's one of the two best goal scorers all time. He is a tremendous skater, too, like Mitchkoff. So maybe the skating. Uh, Mitchkoff will never be as physical as Kovalchuk, but he is well put together and doesn't really shy away. So I think uh, he will have some feistiness to him, especially in the offensive zone, to try and get to the net. So I really, you know, the the thing about Ovechkin, you almost can't compare anybody to him because his parents were Olympic Olympic athletes. His mother won like a gold medal in basketball. Like, right. you know, like you just can't compete with that. The guy's pulling, remember a couple of years ago, he's pulling a tractor in the off season to kind of get ready, right? I mean, you just, yeah, you can't do anything. But I think maybe the longevity is what Mitchkov can get from an Ovechkin game. Like, you know, he'll, he'll be around, maybe he'll be the fl a flyer for life. And maybe that's going to be his legacy. That's close to Ovechkin. Yeah. And, may and maybe he can take some signals in terms of off season training and yes. keeping yourself. Um, I think Malkin does that too, despite the injuries. Uh, yeah. But I think, I think that's really the role modeling that those guys have for a guy like Mitchkov right now. I mean, last year, Malkin's, what, 37? And he was over a point a game. And he played every yeah. game. So yeah. it was a banner year for Malkin, really. Yeah. So I think it's sort of like keeping yourself in the right kind of shape and maintaining, 
you know, your physicality in a way that you can remain effective throughout your right. career. I think that's definitely something that Mitch Kopp can take away from those two. But yeah, I don't think he'll ever be as good as Alex Ovechkin, but no. maybe Malkin in terms yeah, of the Malkin, stats. Malkin stat-wise is something to shoot for. Now Malkin has missed a fair amount of games and we don't know. Mitch Kopp, we don't know if he'll have an injury history or not. Uh, so I do think it's fair to say he could be in the Malkin ballpark. Yeah. Now, I think that's where you say, okay, what's the closest comparison we can make now? And that's obviously Kirill Kaprizov, right? Because yeah. he's the most recent Russian superstar, I would say, we have to compare him to. Um, he was picked in the fifth round in 2015. Um, Minnesota traded, you know, to move up to to take him. And interestingly, this was a Chuck Fletcher, Brent Flair yep. selection. So um, a little bit of a... They just never got to see him play. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, you know, I hate to say that's wild, but it is. So um, I think that in terms of, you know, knowing you'll have to wait because they have commitments in the KHL, there's a comparison to be oh, yeah. made there. There's a comparison to be made in terms of what's the skill set you know, when he does eventually come over and how do you take this time in the KHL to develop and what is that going to look like? I think with Kaprizov, there is sort of a roadmap there, right? Yeah, I think that's the path. Um, I remember I used to get asked all the time, you know, who's the best player outside of the NHL? And I would always say Kaprizov. And they were like, really? And then, you know, even the year he was coming over, like, really? Is this guy really this good? I'm like, trust me, if you watched him in the World Juniors, if you watched him internationally, he's he's going to score at least 30 goals. Like he just, well, and he won the Calder, right? So uh, he's another guy that you just, I think it is almost as identical a roadmap as you could get. And yeah. I think the pre will be a little bit uh, more physical, I think, than, than what Mitch Koff will be. And I think that's, you know, one of the differences, but if he gets, you know, those kinds of point totals in this era of hockey, nobody's going to say it works. No, I don't think so either. I think I think it's a fair comparison, and I think it's a good benchmark to have to look at what Kaprizov looked like when he eventually came over, and you know what the results are. I, th I think that's going to be a, a comparison that will be made early and often. When yeah, and I think here. and I think that's the best one. Like the whole reason we're doing the show is, like you said, there's certain traits and a lot of these players that exist in this kid. And that's why I don't give out comps because he really is the only Kirill Kaprizov. Like he's going to do things that these, some of these other guys have never done. I'm not Kaprizov. I'm not the Mitch Kopp, Sorry. I have Kaprizov on the brain. He is, you know, the only one, like there's never going to be another one. And he will do some things that none of these guys have done. And then as far as, because he's a younger player and the way the creativity is in the game and such now that, that's going to allow for that. So I fully expect some of that to be the case. And, you know, he'll be a big star in the cage. And if he stays healthy when he comes over, you know, he'll have a chance to win the Calder his first year too. Yeah. And I fully expect there to be an NHL graphic at some point of Mitch Koff with like little arrows pointing to different parts of his body and saying, he's got this skill from this Russian player and this skill from that Russian player. Well, if they do, they're uh, copying from us and we're, we're telling <laughs> We're telling the future places you are copying from us now. All right. Uh, yeah, so really interesting to look at the history of Russian players and what Mitchkov could bring from that history to the table and what the comparisons are going to be. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's going to be a fun process to watch him develop over in the KHL and, and see what he looks like when he comes over. Yeah, I, su I suggest to Flyers fans follow him on Instagram. Uh, once in a while, he'll put up some videos that you could see. Uh, he's pretty good at posting. So uh, keep an eye on him. That's, that's one of the best ways until they start playing internationally. You know, you'll see occasional videos on Twitter, but you're not going to see a ton. All right. Well, we have a Mitch Koff adjacent uh, poll question for this week we're going to get to, as well as our nemesis of the week coming up next. All right, we are keeping our summer poll uh, going here. We had a great time reacting to your responses last week, so we're doing it again this week. This week is who is the next Flyers player to be a major NHL award contender? 
And so our choices for this week are going to be Matt Bay, Mitch Kopp, Noah Cates, Cutter Gautier, Carter Hart, or someone they haven't drafted yet. Those are going to be your choices. I like and it. Uh, we will see what your results are and get back to you on the Friday show. And of course, if you have you know someone else on your list that's a current player in the system, you can put that in the comments. So for our nemesis of the week, last week we talked a little bit about the residual effects of Chuck Fletcher on the flyer system and the frustration of having to dig out of some of those contracts and what that means for dead cap space and what it means for the prospect system and all of that. Um, I think for me, the nemesis this week is just thinking ahead to the season and going through another year of the winning is good versus winning is bad discourse, which will inevitably come up because yeah. it's another solid draft next year and people are going to want to get as high a pick as possible and winning maybe doesn't get you there, but winning is also good for prospect development and for confidence. And, you know, there's so many reasons why winning is good for the flyers. Uh, but it, I mean, it's a conversation that we've had, you know, for the past year, year and a half, and it's going to continue. And I'm already tired thinking about it. Better to, for me, it's like better to play in close games than to actually win. Like if you're going to win, Hey, fine. But if you're in games with the young players, that's very valuable. So there is a fine line that you can sort of straddle with this. Yeah, I think so too. So I'm going to let that roll. I don't have anything else. Okay. So our Flyers fun thing for this week. Uh, I don't know about you, Russ, but I did see the Barbie movie this past weekend. I have not seen Oppenheimer as of yet. I think I'm going to wait for streaming because it's too long and I want to be able to press pause and take a break. But uh, with the Barbie Oppenheimer weekend, there's a lot of memes going around. Flyers got in on it and chose Scott Lawton, who is definitely one of the best fashion guys on the flyers and so the uh they posted the outfit for uh going to see oppenheimer versus barbie which was again one of the huge memes going around about it and scott lawton was the perfect flyer to use for this yeah i agree he is the perfect flyer to use uh asking me if i've seen that movie is kind of preposterous i'm i'm kind of like shocked that you even asked me but that's okay um the other thing is which I, movie either oh, the barbie movie no, the Barbie movie. Uh, no, the Barbie movie was perfect. It was absolutely no, no, but asking me if I've seen it, like there's just no point. Um, <laughs> there's no chance I'll ever see it. But the only thing I'll say is I do think it's preposterous this whole because they're on the same opening weekend to go see them both. And and it's like I think it's I, great. I, I love everything no, about it. I don't get it. I don't it makes no sense to me. Well, you got to open your mind to the possibilities. Like, I have a good reason for not wanting to see Oppenheimer in the theater, but I think it's it's a fun combo, and I appreciate everything that everybody's doing about it. Listen, I understand. And dressing up and such. I understand Barbie pretty well. Uh, there are some Barbies in my house, obviously, because uh, I'm married, and I, I, I've seen the career arc of Barbie. Ken, on the other hand, there's nothing there, man. You're just talking about. I'm telling you, you there's haven't nothing seen the movie. there. You don't know about it, and I don't care. There's nothing there's there. Ken, one of the most substantive movies I've seen. Oh one God. of the most brilliant movies I have seen. In oh my movie. God! And I will fight you to the death about it. And until you see it, you have no argument. So I will leave it at that. Uh, thanks for making us your first listen uh, on Wednesday. We are going to get into your mailback questions, but also discuss Travis Sanheim and Travis Konechny and how they fit into the rebuild plan and what that does for expectations for those guys uh, for this upcoming season. As a reminder, you can tweet us at Locked On Flyers. You can email us at Locked On Flyers at Gmail or comment over on YouTube to get those mailbag questions in. I am Rachel. I'm on Twitter at R Miriam. That's R M I R I A M. I'm Russ. I'm, I'm at Sportsology, S P O R T S O L O G Y. Have a great day, everyone.